start us. Pinche puerquitos. Enjoy my last.
your laser. Good hold your laser, thank you.
Siberian Husky, and his name's Pablo.
trying to blind you too, huh, bud? No, oh, I'm not even sure what they're doing, actually. Because yeah. <laughs> I can still, like, film around. I'm yeah, pretty sure they're just making sure... Uh... Yeah, they like to infringe the rights of the civilians. No, I mean, they're technically not breaking my rights, or infringing upon my rights. Good night. Up. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I was just sitting in my car and I just saw them all speed by, so I got out and came over here. But, uh, yeah. The only time we ran into the cops was when we were outside at LAPD, so. Yeah, we ended up back at the park where we started. That's where I figured, but like, I was like, this is way more interesting. Yeah.
of the origin and design of government in general with concise remarks on the English Constitution. Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them. Whereas they are not only different, but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants, and government by our wickedness. The former promotes our happiness positively by uniting our affections. The latter negatively by restraining our vices. The one encourages discourse, the other creates distinction. The first is a patron, the last is a punisher. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one. For when we suffer or are exposed to the same miseries by a government which we might expect in a country without government, our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we furnish the means by which we suffer. Government, like dress, is the badge of lost innocence. The palaces of kings are built on the ruins of the powers of paradise. For were the impulses of conscience clear, uniform, and irresistibly obeyed, man would need no other lawgiver. But that not being the case, he finds it necessary to surrender up a part of his property the furnished means for the protection of the rest. And this, he is induced to do by the same prudence which, in every other case, advises him out of the two evils to choose the least. Wherefore security, being the true design and end of government, it unanswerably follows that whatever form thereof appears most likely to ensure us with the least expense and greatest benefit is preferable to all others. In order to give a clear and just idea of the design and end of government, let us suppose a small number of persons settled in some sequestered master part of the earth. Unconnected with the rest, they will then represent the first people of any country of the, wor or of the world. In this state of natural liberty, society will be the first thought. A thousand motives will excite them thereto. The strength of one man is unequal to his wants and his mind so unfitted for perpetual solitude that he is soon obliged to seek assistance and relief of another, and when his turn requires the same. Four or five united would be able to raise a tolerable dwelling in the midst of a wilderness, but one man might labor out of the common period of life without accomplishing anything. When he had felled his timber, he could not remove it, nor erect it after it was removed. Hunger in the meantime would urge him from his work, and every different want call him a different way. Disease, nay even misfortune, would be death, for though neither might be mortal, yet either would disassemble him from living, and reduce him to a state in which he might rather be said to perish than to die. Thus, necessity, like a gravitating power, would soon form our newly arrived emigrants into society, it's the reciprocal blessings of which would supersede and render the obligations of laws and government unnecessarily while they remain perfectly just to each other. But as nothing but heaven is impregnable to vice, and will, it will call it unavoidably happen, that in proportions as they surmount the first difficulties of emigration which bound them together in a common cause, they will begin to relax and their remissness will point out the necessity of establishing some form of government to supply the defect of moral virtue. <laughs> Dog whistles are fucked up. Some convenient tree will afford them a state house, under the branches of which the whole colony may assemble to deliberate on public matters. It is more than probable that their first laws will have the title only of regulations and be enforced by no other penalty than public esteem. In the first parliament, every man by natural right will have a seat. But as the colony increases, the public concerns will increase likewise. 
and the distance at which the members may be separated will render it too inconvenient for all of them to meet on every occasion as at first. When their numbers were small, their hesitation near, and the public concerns few and trifling. But this will point out the convenience of their consenting to leave the legislative part to be managed by a selective number chosen from the whole body, or are supposed to have the same concerns at stake which those have who appointed them, and who will act in the same manner as the whole body would were they present. If the colony continue increasing, it will become necessary to augment the number of representatives and that the interests of every part of the colony may be attended to. It will be found best to divide the whole into convenient parts, each part sending its proper number, and that the elected might never form to themselves an interesting separate from the electors. Prudence will point out the propriety of having elections often, because, as the elected might be, that returns, that means a turn and mix again with a general body of electors in a few months. The fidelity of the public will be secured by the prudent reflection of not making a rod for themselves. And as a frequent interchange will establish a common interest with every part of the community, they will mutually and naturally support each other, and on this, not on the unmeaning name of king, depend the strength of government and the happiness of the governed. Here, then, is the origin and rise of government, namely a model rendered necessary by inability of moral virtue to govern the world. Here, too, is the design and end of government, viz. <laughs> Freedom and security. And, however, our eyes may be dazzled to show, or our ears deceived by sound, Oh, it's a grasshopper. However prejudice may warp our wills, or interest darken our understanding, the simple voice of nature and reason will say, it is right. I draw my idea of the form of government from a principle in nature which no art can overturn. <laughs> this, that the more simple anything is, the less liable it is to be disordered. And these are repaired when disordered, and with this maximum in view, I offer a few remarks on so the much boisterous constitution of England. That it was noble for the dark and slavish times in which it was erected is granted. When the world was overrun with tyranny, the least removed therefrom was a glorious rescue. But that it is imperfect, subject to convulsions, and incapable of producing what it seems to promise is easily demonstrated. Absolute governments do this the grace of human nature have this advantage with them, that they are simple. If the people suffer, they know the head from which their suffering springs. They know likewise the remedy and are not bewildered by a variety of causes and cures. But the constitution of England is so exceedingly complex that the nation may suffer for years throughout without years together without being able to discover in which the part the fault lies. Some will say in one and some in another, and every political physician will advise a different medicine. Oh, fuck. I know it is difficult to get over local or long-standing prejudice. Yet if we will suffer ourselves to examine the component parts of the English Constitution, we shall find them to be the base remains of two ancient tyrannies, compounded with some new Republican materials. First, the remains of monarchical tyranny as the person of the king. Second, the remains of aristocratical tyranny as the person of the peers. Thirdly, the new Republican materials and the persons of commons on those virtues that pretend depends the freedom of England. The two first, by being hereditary, are independent of the people. Therefore, in constitutional sense, they contribute nothing towards the freedom of the state. To say that the Constitution of England is a union of three powers reciprocally checking each other is fat farcial. Either the words have no meaning, or they are flat contradictions. To say that the commons is a check upon the king presupposes two things. First, the king is not to be trusted without being looked after, or in other words, that a thirst for absolute power is a natural disease of monarchy. Secondly, that the commons, by being appointed for that purpose, are either wiser or more worthy of confidence than the crown. But as the same constitution which gives the commons a power to check the king by withholding supplies, gives afterwards the king a power to check the commons by empowering him to reject their other bills. It again supposes that the king is wiser than those whom he has already supposed to be wiser than him. A mere absurdity. 
There is something exceedingly ridiculous in the composition of monarchy. It first excludes a man from the means of information, yet empowers him to act in cases where the highest judgment is required. The state of a king shuts him from the world, yet the business of a king requires him to know it thoroughly. Wherefore, the different parts, by unnaturally opposing and destroying each other, prove the whole character to be absurd and useless. Some writers have explained the English Constitution thus. The king, they say, is one. The people, another. The peers are in a house in behalf of the king. The commons in behalf of the people. But this have all the distinctions of a house divided against itself. And though the expressions be pleasantly arranged, yet when examined, they appear idle and ambiguous. And it will always happen that the nicest construction that words are capable of when applied to the description of something which either cannot exist or is too incomprehensible to be within the compass of description will be words of sound only. And though they may amuse the ear, and though they may amuse the ear, they cannot inform the mind, for this explanation includes a previous question, viz. How come the king, by a power which the people are afraid to trust and always obliged to check, such a power cannot be gift of a wise people? Neither can any power which needs checking be from God, yet the provision which the Constitution makes supposes such a power to exist. But the previous is unequal to the task. The means either cannot or will not accomplish the end, and the whole affair is a fellow to say. For as the greater weight will always carry up the less, and as all the wheels of the machine are put in, motion by one, it only remains to know which power in the Constitution has the most weight, for that will govern, and through, and though the others or part of them may clog, or as a phase is, check the rapidity of its motion, yet so long as they cannot stop it. Their endeavors will be ineffectual. The first moving power will at last have its way, and what it wants in speed is supplied by time. That the crown is the overbearing part in the English Constitution needs not be mentioned and that it derives its whole consequence merely from being the giver of the of places and pensions its self evidence Come on. Wherefore, though we have been wise enough to shut and lock a door against absolute monarchy, we at the same time have been foolish enough to put the crown in possession of the key. The prejudice of the Englishmen in favor of their own government by kings, lord, and commons arises as much or more from national pride than reason. Individuals are undoubtedly safer in England than in some other countries, but the will of a king is as much the law of the land in Britain as in France. With this difference in Britain, with this difference, that instead of proceeding directly from his mouth, it is handed to the people under the formidable shape of an act of parliament. For the fate of Charles I hath only made kings more subtle, not more just. Wherefore, laying aside all national pride and prejudice in favor of modes and forms, the plain truth is, that is wholly owing to the constitution of the people and not to the constitution of the government, that the crown is not as oppressive in England as it is in Turkey. An inquiry into the constitutional errors in the English form of government is at this time highly necessary. For as we are never in the proper condition of doing justice to others, while we continue under the influence of some leading partiality, so neither are we capable of doing it our, to ourselves while we remain fettered by any obstinate prejudice. And as man who is attached to a prostitute and is unfitted to choose or judge of a wife, so any free possession in favor of rotten constitution of government will disable us from discerning a good one. Have a good night. Have a good night, brother. Me too. What's up? Oh, I think they already left. Yeah, no, I've been uh, filming these guys because they uh they rolled in basically as I like my battery died, so I swapped stuff out. And then uh, I was filming them around like the their HQ, and I saw these guys all roll in. No, don't go underneath there. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I've been here for like 40 minutes. <laughs> Oh, he's been yelling at him. I was coming from across the street and then I decided to read uh, the first chapter of uh, Common Sense.